cut off the the tech part at the end. Um, okay, hi everybody. My name is Jillian. Um, hi. If you want, you can pause the recording and then you can restart it, and it'll. Oh, if I just hit pause up here. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Admitting some folks in the waiting room for just another moment before we get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Great. All righty. I'm sure more people will join, but I will get us started in the meantime. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is a panel as a part of the Contemporary Artist Book Conference. Um, initiated in 2008 by a group of independent volunteers, the Contemporary Artist Book Conference presents in-depth talks, panels, and conversations to further the critical dialogue surrounding artist books. Um, now administered by Center for Book Arts, the CABC committee is made up by a group of independent historians, art librarians, artists, and professionals in the field. The 2024 Contemporary Artist Book Conference, or CABC, will focus on artist books as expanded literacy, um, where we ask, how can the artist book expand upon ideas of information and visual literacy, conceptions of language, data visualization, methods of presenting research, and beyond? Um, a heads up to all that this session is being recorded and it will be available on CBA's YouTube page after the conclusion of the conference. Um, and there will be time for questions at the end of the session. Um, if anyone has questions that they put in the chat, um, you're welcome to do so. And I will read them at the end of the session. Um, this session is entitled Black Feminist Publishing as Liberatory Praxis with Golden Lionheart Collier, Ola, and Christina Long. Um, Golden Lionheart Collier is moderating. Um, they are a transdisciplinary artist, researcher, facilitator, memory worker, and publisher whose praxis honors Black wisdoms and freedom technologies that defy a single static or linear narrative. Their practice and research are grounded in a joyful exploration of Black axiologies and transatlantic networks of kindred ontological and epistemological stances through ancestral movement, performance, print media, lens-based works, ceramics, sound design, and more. They are ultimately most inspired by increasing accessibility to technical craft and the rich fecundity where disciplines, practices, and identities overlap. Through their imprint, Diasporan Savant Press, their publications are in the collections of the Getty Museum Research Institute, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, London College of Communication, the Library of Congress, NYU's Tammament and Wagner Labor Archives, and more. Their lens-based work has shown across the world, including the Melbourne Queer Film Festival, Outfest LA, the Seattle Queer Film Festival, and the Directors Guild of America. Their highest ambition is that their research activate creative practice and process in accessible ways that envision generative present and future possibilities for our world. Um, and Golden, I will pass it off to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I met Jillian this year at um, Codex. <laughs> so that's where I know Jillian from. Um, Ola. Ola is one of the presenters today and is a multidisciplinary artist, who works in collage, printmaking, papermaking, and stop motion animation, which is so cool, Ola, because I did not actually know that you did that. That's lit. She is also a set director, um, decorator for film and TV, and the creator and director of a Brooklyn-based social art project called the Free Black Women's Library. This literary hub, Black Feminist Archive, social site, and community care space features a diverse collection of over 5,000 books written by Black women and Black non-binary folks. Free programs, a free store, a period pantry, a backyard garden, a reading club, and a weekly book swap. She's received artist fellowships and residencies from NYFA, Women's Studio Workshop, Robert Blackburn Printmaking Shop, Brick Arts, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Time Out Magazine, Hyper Allergic, Teen Vogue, and Bus Magazine. Follow the library at Free Black Women's um, Library on socials to stay connected. I met Ola. Where did I meet Ola? I feel like I knew about, somebody had put me on the Free Black Women's Library, and I was like, there was a few really lit Black feminist projects in the United States that I was like, you know what? I just appreciate them. I'm going to send them some gifts. <laughs> so I feel like I sent you and a few other people. It's like five of y'all. And then we, I was at Allied Media Conference and Dreams uh, Loft 
and I'm just talking to a lovely person. And then you were like, Ola, you were like, you're cool. You're golden. You're the one who sent me the sent me the the book. You're the one who sent me, you know, and that's how we met, if I remember correctly. And then Black Girls Oil Press, Gang Gang, is an award winning indie publishing house based in New York City, led by Christina Long. Christina Long is an MFA and global creative director, and her younger sister Courtney Long is a senior editor. Have been running this project since 2013. The press celebrates and documents Black women and women of color who participate in heavy music genres like metalcore, hardcore, punk, and Black metal. Interviewing bands, reviewing music events, and vending at zine fairs allow Black Girls World Zine to introduce readers to new music and the diversity within music scenes. Zines and artist books published by Black Girls World Press can be found in libraries at the Museum, Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art at PS1, the Whitney Museum, the Schomburg Center for Research on Black Culture, the Bernard Zine Library, Reparations Club, and many more. I feel like, Christina, I don't actually remember where we met at, but I feel like it was through Zine World. I feel like it was through Zine World, but- Oh, so it um, might have been at Mokata event. Maybe it was the Mokata event. Was that the first time we met? Might have been. <laughs> Might have been. Might have been. Yeah, we um did a event with um me and Christina are in this book Black Punk Now that just got published earlier this year, last fall, and James invited us to Brooklyn to do um to Mokata to do an event, a publishing event last year. But I really appreciate both of you being here. I think that you're both coming from really unique, interesting places um in the kind of book world and um I'm just privileged to share the space with you all and I had some questions in mind but of course we're just going to talk and chop it up real quick um one of the questions I did have was that Ola I mean I love all the stuff that you're doing with the free black women's library um to make black women's writing and publishing more accessible I guess I'm wondering what you feel like you have an access to such an amazing collection um and such a targeted collection what do you feel like what are the unique qualities that black feminist womanist writers are bringing forward in publishing that compelled you to kind of like begin that project because it is such a cool project um yeah i wonder if you have any thoughts about that thank you uh thank you for having me here this is so cool so yeah, when I started the Free Black Women's Library, it was back in 2015. And part of the issue for me at that point was really wanting to do something, really wanted wanting to be involved in something that explored um, Black women's creative and intellectual output. And also something that felt like I was like learning all the time and something that felt like I was uh, connecting and engaging with other people all the time. So all that adds up to social art praxis, right? So I started the library and um, it was an issue of loving literature and never really seeing a black woman's name on any of these literature lists as far as like what's canon, what's important, what's classic. And looking at media and seeing um, Black women kind of like either erased or criminalized or marginalized or objectified. So it was like a combination of all these different ideas of like wanting to uh, critically address stereotypes and abuse, but also engage in the pleasure and joy of learning and creating, right? Trying to find that balance because up until that point, it didn't feel like that balance was there. It felt like the focus was always combating, defending, as opposed to being in pleasure. Mm -hmm. And reading is one of those things that always gave me pleasure. It always gave me inspiration. And within Black womenist writing and Black feminist writing, I feel like we find so many strategies on survival. <laughs> Uh, and we find so many ways to be inspired um, and we find reflections of ourselves, right? Um, I find myself learning from Black feminist thinkers all the time uh, because the issues that we're dealing with present day in 2024 aren't necessarily new, like they've been dealt with in the past, right? 
So I think there's like seeds that are planted in these books, whether they be fiction or nonfiction, right? Like when you think about like Audre Lorde's Sister Outsider Collection and addressing ideas around how like class, race, and gender intersect. Those issues are still prevalent today in 2024. So we can still talk about it and use that as referential material. Um, and then you think about a book like Parable of the Sower, which takes place in 2024, but was totally fiction and also offers um, a lot of survival strategies and tactics as far as like, you know, how to how to push through within a chaotic uh, world. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that Black women have an inside scoop. Um, because we deal with a lot of different, um, we deal with misogynoir, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of different elements added to that. Um, Black womanhood comes with, you know, some issues of dealing with racism, sexism. And then if you're cash poor, uh, or if you live someone who's living with uh, disabilities, it's just, so within these books, for me at least, and for the other people who use the library, I think they can be very affirming, very nurturing, very educational, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that that's not something that can, that's not something that can be found anywhere. So I have people who've come to the library who didn't even know that Black women wrote books about these topics and these subjects. Um, I have uh, young people who've never been assigned a Black woman author in school. And that's the type of thing that could make you not really like reading, right? When you're constantly reading texts where you don't see yourself in the story. Uh, so I think the library kind of offers uh, people a different portal towards um, appreciating books and um, getting their literature on. So I don't know if I answered your question. I feel like <laughs> all over the place. But I see somebody wrote something in the chat about Parable of the Sower. Yes, it does take place in 2024. Which um, is wild. So, so I will, you know, so I ref I've been referencing that book for the past five years, but I reference it even more now because I feel like it's just so true to life, even yes. though it's fiction, right? Yeah. And when you talk about Black women authors, Octavia Butler is just like an incredible example of somebody who was writing about things that people didn't even think Black women thought about during her time period to the point where they couldn't even put her on the cover, right? Because they thought that would affect the sales because it's like a Black woman writing science fiction. Imagine, but thankfully... I think people's minds are a little bit more open in 2024. So that's no longer the case. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's a perfect example of um, the importance of just reading our literature and being exposed to it. Yes, absolutely. And I feel like too, I mean, it's you spoke to so many things that I think made me want to like bring this conversation forward with you all in this setting. Um, I think it is so rare. I mean, it's, it is unfortunate that there are, seem to be to me and I used to be for a context for me I used to work in schools for like I was like a school-based educator trainer blah blah maybe like 15 16 years before I started being an artist full-time and depending on where you're at I mean sometimes people will never read the entire time they're in school a black woman author um or even learn any black women's history or anything like that and um I do feel like there's just as what you said about the whole <sighs> that the I think something that's contained in black women's writing especially black feminist writing to me it's like I remember when I first started reading I read Sister Outsider I read Pat Parker's Movement in Black well maybe like 17 or something like that and some of the things that Audrey was saying about like how your silence won't protect you just the way I mean I think because she's a poet just being so succinct with language like you know she's like nutritionally dense you know what I'm saying yes but also living out that is not just about writing and being a writer it's so it's a way of living it's a way of moving through the world it's kind of like 
contained in the way that you're in your stride and your aesthetics. It's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's who you are. It's not just a yes. writing something that's a theory. It's practice. It's a way of living and approaching life. Um, and that's, it's encapsulated. I mean, I think the axiologies of like Tony K. Bambara or the axiologies of all of these things are kind of encoded in those texts, but they're not just texts. And it is this kind of way of surviving and having pleasure in the survival. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I love about it. It's like a life manual that kind of, you know, makes you want to work and makes you want to get things done. But also within that work, it reminds you, you know, to rest, to enjoy, to practice pleasure, to connect with nature, like, but also build community, which won't be easy. And like, the struggle is part of the work, unfortunately. <laughs> that And that's part of what I take from Black feminism is that it's constantly pushing and having that critical eye and thinking critically and just sharpening your tools and just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it kind yeah. of, honestly, I mean, it's- I maybe try not sounds... to go into workaholic territory. <laughs> So that's why I'm like pausing with my statements because I don't want it to be perceived as the, as this thing where you need to constantly be in action, but there is an action element to it, you know, like, and Audre Lorde talks about the sister outsider, about the erotic, right? And the erotic is not just sensual and sexual, it's enjoying your cooking, whether you're having a community meeting where you're talking about reproductive justice or whether you're in the house cooking or whether you're dancing with your lover to some music, being in that moment, yes. you know, that kind of, that's kind of like a Black feminist thing for me. Yes, I think so too. It's an embodiment and it's presence. You know, all those things are very necessary. Um, it is not just about kind of this kind of, I mean, there's this, you know, again, I know we could go on and on about Black feminist history and stuff like that, but there's this time where Black feminism enters the academy and then begins to be studied in a certain kind of way that divorces it from, it's just like theory. It's like something we just talk about, but that's not really how the texts are meant to be activated. They really are meant to be kind of practiced in one's life um, and not in a kind of didactic way, but in a way that is encouraging you to discover what is what is sensual for you. And it's the erotic is a source of deep power, not just sensual power, but a source of energy to use to then kind of go into the world and um, be like, an agent like someone with agency who can craft a reality um and that kind of reminds me too like of I mean I know CA you and I come straight up out of I'm sure many scenes <laughs> but for sure out of like you know black punk zine DIY independent publishing scenes um I know that you and your project are working on like hardcore and dealing with people black people black women um and people of color who are in those scenes and I know for me like I used to make a ton of like handmade books when I was a kid like just I would figure out all kinds of weird bindings and stuff like that I just love making my own journals and then writing secrets in them and stuff like that um and that kind of continued into um the zine world through like punk mostly is when I first got in but for me publishing is really about um building community first of all so like I didn't have a lot of recovery community so I started writing about that and those that writing drew those people to me um and then also about disseminating research like things I find out that I'm like oh people should know this what's an accessible way for me to get it out there and I guess I'm just wondering like what do you feel like because black black girls world is is doing a lot of cool things and doing a lot of cool like publishing I know your 10th anniversary 10th year anniversary publication is just about to come out is on pre-order right now, but what do you feel like as a publisher, how does independent publishing, what privileges does it afford you as opposed to like needing to go through kind of more traditional pathways of releasing work? Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I think that that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think you hit the nail on the head as far as like uh, how I approach creative practice in general, not mm-hmm. even just publishing. But um, I've always been somebody who struggled with, even when I was in art school, this idea of, uh, oh, I hope we get accepted or I hope we, uh, hope we uh, get our submission reviewed and I 
hope there's a grant or I hope this foundation or I was always in the back going, who decided that those people get to say whether or not the things we're working on are interesting? Like who's in charge? Uh, and I do have that kind of type A personality, I guess, where I was just like, I, I really was curious, like, who are the decision makers around um, why certain work gets shown or promoted and why other work doesn't? So that is nearly always led me to operate separate from that and um, do my own thing, self-funded entrepreneur, make our own money, spend our money our way. And I think that's what's been very powerful in publishing um, to say, you know, I want to see a magazine about people who look like me um, acting crazy at these rock shows. <laughs> and it's like, I'll book the photo shoot, I'll book the filming, I'll book the promotion, marketing, everything so that we can see it exactly the way we want to see it. And I think for me, that's taken a lot of pressure off of feeling like we had to accommodate any other uh, stakeholders or audiences. Um, it's really just like what we wholeheartedly wanted to see and engage in. So, you know, it's, it's authentic, right? It's as authentic as I can get it to be. Um, and it's a nice, it's a nice feeling. It means that I find what comes with that kind of practice is sometimes no one will be interested in, in what we're doing. Uh, maybe it'll take a while for like-minded uh, folks to discover this thing. Um, um, and so that's okay too, right? It's like sometimes these things do garner an audience, sometimes they don't. But at the end of the day, we cared about making sure it existed so that at any point in time, uh, a young person will stumble upon these, you know, this output and find some resonance in it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the Reno High Fair for James Macropunk, he came to Atlanta. This is back before the festival. This is when the film was out. He came to Atlanta and I saw he was coming. I was working on a um, thesis about Black women's survival kind of strategies like spiritual survival and like thriving strategies in punk and hardcore scenes and I saw he was coming to town I wrote him and I said um I'm gonna need them contacts <laughs> I pulled, pulled right up on him because I you know I grew up in Atlanta so there were a lot of black punks and stuff like that around um in that scene but at the same time I mean kind of going back a little bit to what Ola was talking about oh what you were saying it was just this environment where I felt like there wasn't a lot of visibility. I would go to shows and stuff, but there were Black women mm -hmm. at shows, but in terms of like, when people thought of who was participating in that, it was never someone who looked like me or, you know what I mean? And ever, 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 mm -hmm. which is not even part of the conversation. You were so peripheral, so marginal, so like hyper visible, but also invisible. So I really yeah. love your project. Like when you said you were going to Furnace Fest, I was like, ugh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I haven't been in decades, but. Yeah, I like what you and, uh, what you and go, uh, Ola were also mentioning about um, like a feminist practice that touches on sensuality because I think I'm sitting on it, on another layer to uh, the depth of Black women, which is anger and rage and saying uh, we have the right to be angry and have safe spaces to, to express anger uh, without all these other accusations that you know, it's not ladylike or it's not feminine or it's not appropriate or it's too masculine of a behavior for you to engage in um, as women in general, but as Black women in particular, right? People already call us angry all the time. But it's like, while you're putting on me that I appear angry, <clears throat> I might actually be angry. Don't I have a right to put that somewhere? <laughs> Where mm -hmm. do I get to place that? You know? Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of layers and depth to all of us and deserve uh, places for, for us to express these things so we don't explode. And to do it so, I mean, I loved what you were talking about, I think um, regarding authenticity and regarding kind of like mm -hmm. the gatekeeping that happens in publishing. I mean, I, I think about, you know, one of the ancestors, Toni Morrison, who without her presence at, I think, Random House, uh, Angela Davis's autobiography would never been published. 
Muhammad Ali's autobiography would never have been published. It was only in her singular role as kind of a person that was able to open that door that she was able to make those things happen. But so often those people are not the ones who are making the decisions. And when it comes to writing about black life, um, black philosophy, anything like that, especially black feminist things, you know, it really can be for me, publishing is such a powerful way. It's independent publishing where I'm not needing to ask permission. I refuse to ask permission <laughs> if I want to say it. I just would like mm -hmm. to say it. And if I want to see it, I would just like to do it without having to. I don't, I think that what you're talking about in terms of that validation, needing to get certain validation, needing to kind of go over certain kind of hurdles to execute your vision um, and how independent publishing can be a way around that, that resonates so deeply with me. And I think it's like a real zine ethos. I mean, that scene is just so full of like, it's like my people in some way. I mean, autodidactic, idiosyncratic, weirdos i really love that scene <laughs> like and what black people do with this shit is always super super lit um so yeah i appreciate that it's a certain kind of space and i think that black zine people are like carving out very specific kinds of space in that world that i love so much and i find so um nutritious and i guess that kind of brings me to another thought i had about um just opening up black space oh i know that um I think, I don't know if you know this about me, but I came, I grew up in Atlanta. I was born in like super South Florida, like 30 minutes to Cuba type situation. Um, but after I left Atlanta, I've lived in all these big majority black places um, or big majority black spaces inside of cities. So I lived in West Philly, West Side Chicago, uh, West Oakland, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and it's just like a preference for, uh, you know, me and my mom call that uh, Best I live best I too. Um, the great Negro kingdoms of the United States or what have you. But with the <laughs> but you know, those spaces existed because people refused to, you know, post civil rights era, people refused to integrate, they left the cities, they abandoned them. Um, and then they became big black cities. Um, but now with that kind of the inhalation and exhalation of displacement that's happening right now where I was just in Brownsville, maybe like three weeks ago, four, no, a month ago, a month and a half for the Whitney Biennial. And there were white people in Brownsville. Anyway, side note, but now these spaces are kind of shrinking. And I mean, Atlanta's not majority black anymore. Um, you know, Chicago, you know, it's happening in all these cities, like all these places that I kind of would retreat to in some kind of way, or just like have as my homes um, are like disappearing. And I'm wondering, like, I know that, I believe you are from Best Iola. You can correct me if I'm wrong about that. But um, I guess I'm wondering, like, if you could talk a little bit about what's, like, the importance for you of housing the Black, the Free Black Women's Library, specifically in Best I in Black Brooklyn. Like, what is that? Um, what are your, what's your thinking around that? Yeah, so I'm definitely, I rep for Best I so hard. Yes. Um, it's literally the neighborhood that shaped me into who I am as an artist, as a mom, as an activist, um, yeah, as a nature girl, which is <laughs> hilarious because it is a very urban environment, but through the community gardens and the small farms. So I love bed -Stuy, right? And back almost 10 years ago, uh, my one of my very first bedside social art projects was around community gardens and just traveling by bike to different gardens. And then when I started the library, it was really important for me to have the library here because at the time, it <clears throat> felt like the wave of gentrification was just starting. And it was kind of ominous. Like I, <laughs> it's hard for me to not talk about gentrification as like this, you know, this kind of like scary monster. It's just hard for me to not picture it as that. It just kind of like comes in like chomps away at all the things that has made, um, that makes a neighborhood a neighborhood or feel like a neighborhood. For me, that's my perception. You know, I can only speak from my own perspective, but just seeing the, seeing the neighborhood change from being like local businesses, black owned businesses, um, seeing the neighborhood change from being very Black diasporic, 
people from the Caribbean, people from the continent, people from down south, people who've been in Brooklyn, their family's been here since the brownstones were a nickel, like this mix of cultures and being able to just go to your local hardware store and the person who works there, like, you know, their kids and the dry cleaner and the person who fixes shoes. It was just a vibe, right? Even mm -hmm. though it's very much an urban environment, it was just a very beautiful vibe. And then there was this sense of like these small businesses disappearing <clears throat> and being replaced by coffee shops and wine bars, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, mm -hmm. what is happening? This is not, this is not it. This is not it, right? And then hearing stories about people being tricked out of their brownstones, right? And those brownstones being hollowed out and turned into dwellings of six when it's really meant to be a dwelling for three. You know, all these different things. Um, so part of what, when I started the library, I called it a love letter to bed from the very beginning. Because I was like, this is, this library is going to be born here and it's going to live and thrive here. And it's going to be a space, a container, right? It's going to be a container for holding the beauty uh, and the sacred nature of like Black culture, Black history, community building, that vibe, that bed that old school bed vibe. And even though the library at the time was traveling from place to place, whether it be an uh, art gallery or a barbershop or a vintage clothing store or community garden, it always was about capturing that vibe, an intergenerational space, a space <clears throat> where people from all different spiritual belief systems can come together, mm -hmm. a space where different genders can come together and really just chop it up whether it's talking about books, talking about art, talking about politics, talking about the weather, right? Talking about Beyonce. It's that container, that kind of family, intimate feel, not so much of safety, but of camaraderie and like mutual respect. Because that's how bed always felt for me. Mm -hmm. And it really concerns me that when gentrification happens, that feeling disappears, um, and those people disappear. Cause I'm like, where do they go? Like, did they leave because they wanted to leave or did they leave because they felt forced out? Like were they tricked? There's so many stories. Mm -hmm. Um, so the library just represents, in addition to so many other things, I feel like it represents that pushback against gentrification and the kind of like anti-gentrification space or narrative, mm -hmm. right? Or energy. Um, like this is we've we are like what is um what do my girls black rad women radical say we are here and we've always been <laughs> right like exactly. we're here and we've always been like you know i don't care how many condos pop up and how many businesses disappear like this vibe has always been here it's what best is known for and as long as the library's here it will always be here so yes yeah yeah, it's kind of amazing. Like having lived in all the different cities and seeing now when I go back to visit, all of them kind of turn into the same city, the same businesses, the same people. It's just like, it is very ominous. It's like makes my skin yeah. crawl, if I'm honest with you, to see. Because all of them to me were like my lovers who I would go and you know spend some time in this one and spend some time with this one. And they had a very distinctive, to me, profile in terms of the feeling of them um and best i was always a vibe that was the first place when i went to new york when i went to that first apple Hook festival me and my homegirl knuckles got the um elbows got the greyhound up we stayed at the ymca for one night and i was like nope james gonna let us stay with him <laughs> we didn't know where he was gonna stay but he had a brown snow all full to the no strength and oh, i remember wow. that's my first time going to new york but i was like i, I didn't know what to expect really but to me, it reminded me of home. There were people there who had Southern accents. They, the, the porch or the site of the stoop was activated in a very similar kind of way. Yeah. And it felt like uh, it was not my home, but it was like my home in a very way that was like, ding, 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 right. We all share these kind of things in some ways. 
So I really think it's important that, um, you know, the Free Black Women's Library is in Best Eye. And um, I, I looked on the website when I was preparing for this. It's been a while since I've been on there, but I was just looking at all the faces of the people who have come through the, the library and they're holding their books and the cheese. They just eat cheese and they're so happy that, you know, to just have the books and to have the space that even exists to just, you could just tell the joy that people are having engaging with the books that are in the collection out in the world and all the places that you set up. And I love that you go to many different kinds of places to bring the library and the collection to, because that's really important. I think Marlon Riggs speaks a lot about needing to take films. He would play it in a bar. He played in a library. He yeah. played wherever. It doesn't need to be at a, a, a film theater, that the site, that it needs to be activated across many different sites for many different people and exactly. not just be like it only belongs in the theater house for these people fine art house people he was like it is art house but it art house belongs to everybody if it's real it belongs to everybody exactly, <laughs> exactly. that's why that's why accessibility is so important to me you know and I always want the library to feel like a space that's open to everyone as long as you value what's happening in this space then you're welcome to be there and it is nice seeing people with their books. Sometimes they're so excited. Someone comes into the <laughs> library and there's nothing more exciting than when someone comes into the library looking for a very specific book and the title in mind and I have that book and I'm able to give it to them. That's the best feeling, right? They're like, mm -hmm. oh, do you have Mules and Men by Zora Neale Hurston? And it's like, here it is. They're just like, yes, I've been looking for this book everywhere. <laughs> so, Yeah. It's a great feeling. That's why I sometimes call myself a book fairy. I don't know what to call myself, but it's really mm -hmm. fun to just see how excited people get about books. So yes, and about black women's and black non-binary people's writing specifically. Um that actually makes me think of another question that I had thought of for us, like as a group. Um last year I did a presentation at San Francisco Art Book Fair. Um around like uh independent publishing i did all this research into like queer black queer trans and feminist publishing <clears throat> and you know without again without that kind of independent publishing route we probably would not have had sister outsider or this bridge caught my back or uh the kambahi river collective statement if they had to go to a publisher and say please 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 pretty please can you we wouldn't have got it uh -huh. or park you know pet park is moving in black so like from zines to like trade paperbacks um you know all these independently published titles by black women and gender expansive folks i guess i'm wondering if you all think there's a way in which at least for me i think that um there's so many even from when i started my press you know almost 10 years ago now too there seems like there to me is a proliferation at this moment in time where at a moment where like independent publishing like access to ways of dissemination for publishing like being able to you know disseminate something digitally as a book or being able to print things on demand that kind of access not accessibility but options for proliferation are kind of they seem like there's a lot more growing numbers of ways for people to get information and publications out to people but i'm wondering if for um, C.A. and Ola, do you all feel like the kind of increase in accessibility for self-publishing has made that project or that kind of ambition easier or more complicated or like what your thoughts are about that? Because for me, I feel like I'm seeing a lot more people engaging with like zines and stuff like that, and independent publishing, but also too, in some ways, I feel like there can be sometimes like a noisiness, <clears throat> not a noisiness, but like I guess, I don't know, I, that's just a question I have. Uh, something I think about a lot because I do a lot of like art book fairs and zine fairs and stuff like that. And I'm like, this is cool because it's letting some people have a voice or like giving people access to being able to put their ideas out there. But then also I'm like, is it is it solely just increasing accessibility and that's a good thing? Or is, there, is it complicated? Is it complicating things? I don't know. Because I feel like, yeah, Zora Neale Hurston didn't have, <laughs> you know, the ability necessarily to just go out and like publish her books on her own. You know, she might need to go through a publisher, a standard publisher. But I wonder if y'all have any thoughts about that. I think it's a good question. Uh, it's a good question. I do think it comes up like people, you know, here and there, people will ask me kind of like, how did you get certain opportunities? Aren't there so many other people in the space? Like, isn't there a competition? And I think where I'm still at right now is, is not that many of us out here doing this. I wish we had more competition, right? Like, 
And for someone like me, like I like to look at things from a probably a more analytical perspective at times. All you gotta do is go to the federally, uh, the, the USPTO office for federally registered trademarks, and then your state, uh, whatever, whatever state you live in, you can look up the names of open LLCs. There's no federal trademark, no one owns a lot of the language around black girls, black women, uh, black radical feminism, uh, black women in certain music spaces, black women in emotional states of various kinds. Um, like from a business standpoint, no one owns those trademarks, logos. People really aren't formally doing that much in my opinion, but I'd love to see more. I'd love to see that. Uh, the things that we're all putting out there inspire uh, more people to get involved and put something on paper, right? Because I do think this is an era where uh, people are coming to <coughs> appreciate printed matter in a fresh way, shall we say. Um, people still have a kind of different relationship to things when they're in a book form than when they're online. They feel a different kind of connection to it. Um, that's my two cents. I'd, I'd like to see more competition or a, more activity as far as uh, Black women being centered in all their different uh, forms. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I actually was, um, <clears throat> before 2020, I had just moved to Philly. I was like, I know what I'm finna do. <clears throat> I'm finna have me a black queer and trans ain't this. Cause I just wanna <laughs> say, I don't wanna be around. <laughs> I wanna see, I feel for me, I feel like the side of particularly like the zine fest is always so fascinating in terms of the publications that come forward. But I'm like, what would it be like to have like an independent publishing event that just was for children? Like everybody was under nine years old. What would it be like to have one that was only people who are over 70 years old? What would it be like to have publications by people who um, could not hear or could not see. Um, I feel like <clears throat> I'm so interested in the voices always that are not included. <laughs> um, like, I feel like that's a really interesting place. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always like, okay, well, this is it's definitely part of the work that I do is just trying to, um, for a couple years in a row, I had did um, zine workshops for release, rela relationship abuse prevention program in New York City. Because mm -hmm. teen relationship like violence is really intense um but it was just a workshop about like zines and like well what do you want to say well right. then let me show you how you could say that <laughs> and get it out there and you don't need the permission of any adults you don't need the permission of any teachers your voice is needed so say that say exactly what you want to say you know what i mean and get into just knowing how to do that for yourself um so yeah i'm I'm wondering, Ola, do you have any thoughts about, about that last thing? I mean, I feel like you have such a unique um, vantage point because you have access to such an amazing collection um, of literature and books. And also, too, I just think the community spaces that you're running are really amazing, too. But I wonder if you have, if you have any thoughts about that kind of increase in accessibility and, like, the effect that it's having on kind of the, the broad field of publishing. Or do you see any of that in your work as an artist or as a you know the person who runs your project increasing in accessibility in terms of accessible to literary materials kind of like i feel like for publishing thank you for that clarification basically for me i feel like i'm seeing a lot of more people engaging independent publishing a lot through zines but then yes. other things like that and i guess i'm wondering if you see how you see that operating in terms of like opening up the field of publishing is it like, what, what do you see that, do you see that as having an impact, I guess, on, like, the current kind of landscape of publishing? Uh, not as of now, but I hope it, mm -hmm. but I hope that it does. Um, I think it's really wonderful that um, the publishing industry uh, no longer feels like this gate kept kind mm -hmm. of, like, you know, point of legitimacy for authors, um, especially like Black women authors, Black non-binary authors, um, authors whose voices may not be heard or taken seriously by publishing companies because they don't have an agent or because they don't have an MFA or whatever like that, right? I think it's really wonderful that people can write out their thoughts, um, whether it be in a zine printed out on Riso 
or even on Substack, you know, once mm -hmm. a month or in a chat book that they publish through Amazon or through a small press, right? I think that is awesome. Like I'm in the middle of a residency at the Metropolitan right now where I'm plan where I'm publishing a book at the end of the year. There's, I'm sure that if it wasn't for this residency, I wouldn't be able to like publish something independently, right? Uh, because thanks to the Met, I have the budget to do that. Um, it's expensive. There mm -hmm. is the only advantage to me as far as getting published by a bigger company is maybe, maybe <laughs> they'll, pro they'll promote you, right? You could get a book deal and get three books published and they don't take, still won't take your calls, right? Mm -hmm. And not just that, but they've edited your flavor out of your story, right? Or they've made this decision about your cover that you don't like, right? Yes. That story just went viral. So there are some pros and cons to mm. getting a publishing deal. I think there's more pros to, to being an independent publisher. Personally, mm -hmm. you own your work. You have the right to your work. You're not, you know, you, the way it comes out is how you want it. You don't get to like... Like I have friends who are published authors who've gotten amazing book deals. Like that signing bonus is really nice. Like 80K, 120K, that sounds incredible. But is that the story you wanted to tell? Now that book is out there, it has your name on it for perpetuity, okay? <laughs> um, so I guess it depends. You have to pick and choose. But I know people who have sat with editors and editors have told them, Oh, could you make this a little bit more black? Could you make this a little more street? Um, how about a little bit more? We don't feel like these characters mm -hmm. are struggling enough, right? Mm -hmm. Here's some examples of what happened. Whereas if you decide to publish your own chat book about your own life and you want to use um whatever type of language, um, you don't have to worry about being edited. So that's a beautiful thing. The the hard part is probably the printing, the cost for the printing, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why maybe you only make 10 copies or 15 copies of whatever you're doing. You see how those sell. You keep that money. You apply for grants. You harass people. You launch <laughs> Kickstarter. Who knows, right? You You make it happen, right? If you mm -hmm. have a passion for this, and you want your voice out in the world, you make it happen. It's going to keep gnawing at you. At least for me, I know with my passions, they gnaw at me. And it's like, you want to do this. You need to like, go do it, child. It's not going to just poof happen out of thin air. So I, I think it's great. And I want more of that. I want more of that. I want more diverse voices. I want to mm -hmm. hear from more Black women in punk. I want to hear from Black neurodivergent folks that are out there I want to hear from black people who travel who live in Antarctica like I want to hear different voices um because I love it I you know it every time I read something by somebody who is not me I learn something about mm -hmm. how to be a better me and I appreciate that right I I think it's great like I went to a art book fair recently and mm -hmm. It was like chocolate chips and a huge vat of buttermilk. It was so <laughs> melanin in that place. And I was like, I can't believe in 2024. In 2024, period. There are still art events with so little Black people. Like a sprinkling of POC and Black. I'm like, this can't like... If you're if you're having some type of art event that's supposed to be about community and artistry, you need to make it a point to make sure that it's a diverse space. You want different voices in that space. Diversity makes things beautiful. Can that, I add to that? Like nature is the perfect example of that. So anyway, I just went off on a rant. I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, CA. Can I it's just like please. I want more. I, I let's yes. let's like let's decolonize all these spaces that are seen as ivory towers and ivory spaces, publishing, fashion, book fairs, museums, 
it's time. Like it's 2024. Yeah. Time to decolonize and diversify, like actively. That's yeah. that's where I'm at. So real quick, like I think that's a good point um, on that the ivory tower piece. I do feel like similar to the music industry, these publishing companies wanted to present this air that um, working working with them, they can manage the administrative parts of uh, your creative practice, right? Uh, we'll handle all the legal stuff. And I think that's why I mentioned trademarks before because uh, what we're seeing now is we don't need their help to make sure that the things we create are legally protected under the law. We have copyright, we have our trademarks, we have attorneys. Um, and I think that's a part of it too, of uh, we don't have to work with you to make sure that we still have all our ducks in a row and we can operate as legitimate businesses um, that are not to be copied or have our work stolen, right? Um, so that's yeah. a big piece for, for me too, of like sharing that knowledge too, of helping folks put together a, a creative practice that they like uh, while protecting themselves at the same time. Yes, yes. yes. I yes. agree. And that's extremely important. And I love that you said that because I think also um, sometimes we may not see uh, the value in the work that we're doing and understand that what we're doing can be monetized and can be, um, um, I don't know. I'm leveraged. Saying, yes. <laughs> it can be leveraged in all these different yes. ways. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll say legitimized for lack of a better word, but that's important um, because that definitely adds value to the work. Absolutely. I was just actually, when I was at Codex, which is like the biennial Super Bowl for art book fairs. Um, and to be fair, I never have seen, I've never been to a book event where craft was elevated to such a level. I was gagging. It was three days long. I was just like, but at to your point, Ola, um, the recipe was what you just described. <laughs> the, the the mixture of the recipe was about what you said. Um, and it is so was, awkward. It's so it's, awkward. I'm like, well, what's happening? It is, and it's it's also one of those things for me too, where I go into those spaces and with such a deep love of books and a book art, and then to go into those spaces and have people silently, but unanimously kind of be questioning, um, what, are, what are you doing here? You know, they're not saying it, sure. but they're confused why I'm there. Um, they're, they're just, you know, like they're just curious, like, oh, one of those. And it's like, you know, <sighs> Like you, like I think, like all of us, I really do want to see more. More, I, I don't even think it's out for me. I don't think of it even as a diversifying as much as reflecting reality. You know what I mean? Reflect who actually is interested in this shit, not exactly. just who can. You know what I mean? Like just reflect. Right. That's the how I feel because I'm like, you know I mean? know I'm not the only person that's into. I know I'm not the like. <laughs> You know, maybe you might have tricked me into thinking that when I was 17. Oh, nobody likes punk music except me. But nah, I'm grown now. And I understand that there's Afro punks all over the world. So don't even try it. Right. right? It's intense. But I was, I read this, I did this uh, research visit at the Letterform Archive during Codex. And I asked them, to, you know, I had my recipe that I asked them for to bring out for me. And I read this book by Chimarenga, which is a publishing outfit in Zimbabwe, I think. I could be wrong if somebody knows in the audience. Please let me know if I got that wrong. They have some amazing publications of theirs at actually at um, CARA, the Center for Art Research and Alliances, Artistic Research and Alliances in New York. Um, but one of the big paragraphs I remember was about art book fairs and how the whole their whole collective was kind of like, we're just kind of taking a step back because of what you said, that formula of like, you know, inclusion. It's like, no, don't include anybody. Just reflect who's actually, you don't need to include. No, I don't want to be included <laughs> I mean, <laughs> into the party. Let me assimilate into that. But um, I want to see what work that actually is like reflecting who the, the broad range of people who are actually interested in this kind of work. Right. Um, and I and also the, feel and like- the political, the political aspects of the work too. Yes. Yes, because that's like almost absent from those kind of really high key art book environments. I think it's considered kind of gauche to actually speak to political work. To me, I found, I feel like people are really, yeah, I think it's distasteful I, almost kind of to. I, 
yeah, I think I've learned, I've learned on early on here, like in the New York uh, space, that I had to be very particular about what events I would table, um, mm. because there were quite a few early on where you know I'm just going it everywhere, anywhere, and I realized in some of those spaces that weren't very diverse, they would look at Black Girls World and say. I'm going to support this because it's so odd and peculiar and unusual, right? And I was kind of like, I'm not here to present as an unusual thing. I'm saying there's a real community of, of young women interested in, in what, you know, interested in music and stuff. And they're just like, that is so odd. How odd? I'm like, yeah, this isn't my audience, right? My audience was... It is uh, people who are curious about learning more about music maybe they haven't been exposed to, right? So, it, yeah, I do think we have to be careful. Like, do we want to be in some of these spaces? I certainly come to the conclusion sometimes no one. There's nobody going to the thing, and there's no one presenting at the thing that um, need to be anywhere around what we are trying to talk about. Unfortunately, I had a quote, a patch I had made that had the quote from a sister outside of this said, what are the silences you swallow day by day? I, I, I'll, I'll, I bet you know what I'm talking about, but it's like a very famous, what are you not saying, basically, um, from okay. your silences will not protect you. And a woman at San Francisco Art Book Fair said to me last year, she walked up and she read it and she looked right in my face and said, you ought to be ashamed. You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> What? Ashamed of yourself for what? Yeah. The, the of real yourself? kind of, huh? she said, I should be ashamed of myself. She screamed at me. I had to actually get her removed from the venue. <laughs> but what, what, what made her say that? That she just felt like I shouldn't be. I was like, she said it was really bleak, the statement and that, um, that Audrey had made. And I was like, actually, she's talking about a sense of kind of hopefulness, really, about like speaking the truth. Say the truth. You don't have That's much time. It's, oh not a, it's not bleak, it's not hopeless, it's, it's not, not bleak at all. It's, it's not, not bleak at all. <laughs> it's not bleak at all. Like it's yeah. for not wanting to have a critical thought and like examine your actions and movements in life. What? But that was kind of the tempo that that was kind of the feedback in general that I was getting at that I get sometimes at book fairs and just being an artist who is making work that is not afraid of speaking directly to political things. I think it's all, to me, it's not separable. It's not like, oh, this is political, this is art. It's like, it's life, you know what I mean? All but connected. It's all connected. connected. I, yeah, my personal self and my political self, they don't only intersect, they're right on top of each other. Like, nah. nah. Yeah, and that's this work, interesting. Like, publishing work is political because it's about making your thoughts and ideas accessible, right? If you're making zines, that means that you you have a statement right? You're putting a statement out there, you know, and as a Black woman, as a Black artist, as a Black person in this country, um, <laughs> I don't know about anywhere else, because I, you know, but under capitalism, racism, anti-Blackness, writing a statement, whether you're sharing a statement about sobriety, um, doing your, making your own hair products, like, <laughs> It's all political to me. <laughs> That's yes. how I see it. That's how I see it. Yes. So Even if it's that, just I'm political. So sorry that happened to you. That's horrible. I'm so it sorry. It was I had that experience. not a good experience. It was the I'm last sorry. art book fair that I did. And I kind of was like, I don't know if I should be doing this anymore. <laughs> I don't know if this is wow. for me. Like, I really don't know if this is like, this is the way for me. Um, which is a sad feeling I feel like, because I, I feel like, you know, into publishing but you know again it's just it is a question like you were saying CA of kind of deciding and having that discernment as a publisher what environments make sense and what which ones mm -hmm. don't which ones are like yeah you know nutritious and are, are nourishing and which ones are kind of you know you're being included but maybe the audience is just not not for the work that you're producing it's just it takes time to know those things with different um, events and it things does. Like that. I had to learn that lesson too because when I first started the library I said yes to every invitation because mm -hmm. I was so excited that somebody appreciated what I was doing but not only was did I become burnt out but I also learned that not every space is where I need to be just for my own mental health my own emotional mm -hmm. health and my actual creative energy so I feel like pick and choose 
and create boundaries yeah. with myself and really examine like is this going to nurture me as a person is it going to help the library grow mm-hmm. or is this going to be something where I walk away feeling kind of defeated and victimized and used right Mm -hmm. I just want to say like Golden your work is so beautiful and so important like the zines that you've made I don't know if I told you this but my daughter sent me a package of your zines as a birthday gift like (laughs) years ago and it was so cute that she thought I didn't know you already but it was like my child really knows me like she sent me the Audre Lorde one I was like wow This is amazing. It felt like a circle, right? And I love that you do that work and just just know that you're continuing a legacy of work that's been happening for decades. Like the work that you're doing is so important. So I'm really sorry that happened to you. Like, I'm like, oh, I want to shake that person. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Me too. I want to do more to shake. Yeah, I agree with Ola. Actually, I would also like to say, um, I'm pretty sure I was cooking collecting your work golden and buying stuff off your Etsy long before we met (laughs) um and decorating my apartment with like there's still good you made in every room (laughs) because I really like it's iconic I really like your content and and uh the way you put things together um I also want to add too like I'm reminded of that uh, that New York City lesbian archive and mm-hmm. like how there is so much uh, kind of underground content you might say or zines around like the queer experience and I think that can be perhaps an example like that counters some of these larger fairs and things of um, some of these more private areas, private archives, private libraries, where it, it does feel like sometimes you're uncovering a secret, right? Especially if you find materials uh, from decades past where people are talking about their lived experience from those times, you know? So that's what I always say, like, yeah, I question, you know, the relevance of institutions sometimes because we don't actually need institutions like we put things together <laughs> and save things and protect things ourselves um mm-hmm. so yeah yeah I mean that's part of the reason so like I'm so glad that CAU and Ola y'all decided that y'all were trying to do like coming on this panel that y'all were interested in doing it and I approached like a, a few people there's like five different people and every single one of the people I approached to me I feel like is moving I love that you brought up CA that kind of like and um, Ola, the lineage, to me, it's like the lineage to me, I feel like, yes, I have this project for me anyway. I feel like I have a project that I'm working on, you know, and I'm doing my things, but I do not feel as though I'm moving solo. Like, I feel like I'm moving in a very um, real lineage of people who, starting back with like mm-hmm. um, the appeal, like David Walker's The Appeal, the use of... Um, kind of independently published works to circulate information, to organize people, to inspire people, to create beauty um, and things like that. And uh, I feel it's like so that's, a, it's so powerful. It's really like, intense, I know you, but it's I like, know you know about fire, right? Yes. <laughs> like, you talking about fire or you talking about fire, the science, the um, speculative fiction. Um, oh, I'm, I'm talking, talking about fire them. from the um, from yes. the 1800s. They pulled one of those from the letter form archive. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like when you think about how information within political movements, within Black political movements and Black cultural movements has been disseminated um, over time, right? Having our own newspapers, our own journals, slipping each other little notes, like all of that is connected to to what you're doing now, you know, to, to so much of what's happening at the library. Like it's just... I'm with it. I'm with it. And I think something that I talked about in the piece that I put in Black Punk Now was just about how, you know, as a freedom technology, zines really do, particularly zines, but I think independently published things generally, the zines particularly, that fugitivity is real because it, it's a way to escape, especially zines that are not digital, a way to escape or get around that kind of surveillance, that growing surveillance, kind of almost like panopticon type of surveillance that we live in in terms of getting information to people 
Um, yes, Christina, share them links. Um, <laughs> um, but it's it's this way of getting around that, getting around the surveillance for young people of adults, their surveillance on them, getting around, you know, for, for groups to organize while the digital space, we feel so comfortable in it. It's not really the digital overlords of these spaces. It's not really ours. Like, yeah, we got an email, you yeah, know, we got websites, but the keys to those things are not necessarily in public hands or even known hands most of the time. Mm -hmm. It's not really running things um, and who's controlling them. So it's very important um, to, mm -hmm. to remember those things. I do want to say I have another question for us to just kind of start mm -hmm. wrapping up. If people have questions in the chat, please put them in the chat. If we have a little bit of time left, we can answer them. But um, while people are thinking about if they have any questions or not, I did want to kind of ask one more question to mm -hmm. Ola and to Christina. Well, it's a two part question. One is what kind of what projects are you working on right now that you're like really excited about if you have anything going on like that? And then also what excites you about the future of publishing for I think for black folks, kind of more broadly speaking, but also for people, um, black women, black non-binary and black trans people working in this kind of truth bearing tradition um, versus like, you know, and truth, I'm saying that as kind of like a more personal truth, like telling one's personal truth as opposed to like some kind of objective <laughs> truth telling. But I guess, yeah, what projects are you working on right now that you're really excited about? And then, yeah, what excites you about what's the kind of work you want to see? I mean, it's, I think people have already spoken to it. Um, so, but yeah, I guess I'm wondering about those, those things for you all. I guess I could jump in. So, um, like Golden mentioned earlier, the big thing for Black Girls World this year is it's our 10 year anniversary. Hey. And we have a special edition <laughs> version of our zine that's available on our website. We're also tabling at lots of different events this year where um, you could catch us there, but I highly recommend going to the website first. Um, and it's been a really great chance to um, share with everyone all the things we've done in the last 10 years here in New mm -hmm. York and abroad uh, around this community of um, young women um, finding new music and, and celebrating their love of a music that sometimes is not um, receptive to us. Uh, so I always highlight that is um, even though they might not like us in this space or in this environment, the music is that good that we keep showing up, right? Um, so there's that. And then we're also co-organizing the Punk Island Music Festival this summer. Oh, so Punk Island. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> we're going to have a zine fair as part of that music festival. So that's taking place on June 8th on Randall's Island, and it's free and open to the public. So feel free to come check that out. I think they've got over 80 bands scheduled to play throughout the day. And we have over, um, I think, 20 zinesters and different art workshops happening in addition to the live music. So yeah, and okay. yeah, that's amazing. What excites you about the future of publishing, CA? What do you? Oh, what you future of publishing. Oh, I don't know. Everything's so topsy turvy these days, right? I think the social media companies thought they had a level of control over things, uh, like you said, the search engines thought they had control. Uh, the publishers thought they had control. I think we're just gonna continue to see a movement of people doing their own uh, publishing, right? Their music, mm. their art, whatever, um, and really building out these in-between spaces where we're not looking to some larger authority to tell us uh, what's cool and what's not, or to get the word out, or, you know, like I like to remind people like back in the day, right, zines were shared through like little penny orders, right, people just mailing things to each other, right, so yeah, we, we will continue to find alternative ways to connect with each other, um, I expect, yeah. Period. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm currently an artist in residence at the Metropolitan Museum. So through that residency, I'm publishing a book that will be coming out in December, which features the work of about 20 different uh, Black femme 
writers and artists, an mm -hmm. anthology of sorts um, on survival and rage and safety and all those fun things. Um, so definitely look out for that. And um, I will be at the Zine Fair tomorrow. Um, if you're, hey. in, you're in New York City, the Free Black Women's Library is a co-sponsor for an amazing event happening tomorrow called the Black Zine Fest. Um, that's going to be a powerhouse arts. So that's going to be amazing. And that's then at the Free Black Women's Library, we have tons of free workshops pretty much every weekend. We've had zine workshops in the past. As well as as well as collage, uh, workshops, and we're going to have a book arts workshop this summer. So, part of what I love about having this space is getting to do free events like this, where we get to have people from the community come in and um, not just learn about these crafts, but put their own different uh, spin on it, right? Mm -hmm. Put their in, and put their own ideas. Uh, whether you're a single mother, or whether you're somebody who's you know, a, a Beyonce super fan, like, if you want to explain <laughs> about that, we're going to teach you how to do it, you're going to make it, and you're going to walk away with your special zine, and maybe new ideas in your brain about mm -hmm. storytelling, and ways that paper can be used, and manipulated, and things like that, so it's pretty fun, and it's, um, it's something that the community really appreciates, uh, because oftentimes, those type of workshoppy moments can be a little bit pricey. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's nice to have a space where you can come in, try something, experiment uh, with book arts. Um, in addition to that, we have writing workshops if uh, folks are interested in writing. So working on a lot of things, like working on so many things. And hopefully one day, would love to have my own small press. Uh, that's yeah. like a dream for the future, inspired by Black feminists of the past, right? The Combe mm -hmm. River Collective, this bridge called My Back, mm -hmm. all these different books that they put out that they knew the um, publishing companies uh, weren't going to get behind. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, they put they created their own presses and put those books out on their own. Mm -hmm. So that idea really inspires me to possibly do something like that with the library one day. Mm -hmm. uh, we shall see. But for now, the zines have been a good time. Uh, making scenes have been a good time. And as far as like the future of publishing goes, I don't know what to make of it because there seems mm -hmm. to be trends that happen, trends that come and go. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm hoping will happen is just, just that People who feel marginalized, dismissed, criminalized, ignored by society uh, will find ways to share their stories and share their voices. So whether that's through zine making, performance, dance, film, poetry, uh, activism, doing healing justice work, becoming a doula, like I, what I wish for everyone is to find uh, what excites them and inspires them to uh, keep going and keep learning and just keep expanding as a, as a spirit, right? So that's what I'm hoping <laughs> for, all, for all the people of the world. <laughs> yes, yes. I feel like um, I don't, so in terms of like projects right now, I'm learning modular synthesis um which that is a world that talk about again the recipe we go keep going back to all of the recipe that you mentioned <laughs> i walked into the portland synth expo uh which is where i'm at for grad school uh maybe like three weeks ago i walked there and i it was like a movie it's like everybody just stopped talking like <laughs> <laughs> you know i can laugh about it now because i'm just like it won't stop me from doing anything you know what i mean i'm exactly. still gonna do it <laughs> Exactly. But, um, That's how I feel about paper arts too. Like yes. I love making, I love making paper. Paper arts, it's like my jam. Like I love it so much. But sometimes it feels like I'm not seeing other folks. But I'm like, you know what? I love this. And I know that whoever I'm meant to meet along the way, they'll they'll come across my path eventually if I just mm -hmm. keep saying like spirit led. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But still, mm -hmm. sending you love and protection. But still. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah, I'm working on some book projects right now. I'm working on this suite of books that's about the research was started out about like kind of like um, herbalist practice from the Southeast, like, and how the herbalist practices that I grew up with were also connected to like not just medicine and food, but also like spiritual practices and things like that. And the role of certain particular kinds of like cultivars and plants, particularly heirlooms that have been kept, the lineages we kept for sometimes you know, that we know of more than a century by Black people in the Southeast, like Moody family, you know, uh, cultivar of okra and stuff like that. When I was doing the research for the okra, I found out that okra is actually the Akan word for soul. And wow. so it kind of branched out. It was deep. It started branching out into um, a suite of different books around the research that I'm, I'm working on publishing right now. Um, and I'm just excited about, for me, I really just hope that the field just keeps expanding in terms of publications. I feel like the more people publishing, the better, really, especially like Black, queer, trans people, Black women, like disabled people, just marginalized people. I'm like, I really, whenever their voices are uplifted, it just, I think there's something so powerful about seeing someone like you or perceiving someone like you come in contact with work by someone who shares some kind of identity with you that creates a kind of realm of possibility that is so powerful, you know what I mean? And so I feel like, I hope that the work that we're all doing is able to help other people. Even if they, For me, even if people interact with my things and they're like, this is not for me, this is not it, but maybe I should make, <laughs> even if they see myself and they're like, I don't like this at all. I could do way better than this. I'm gonna publish something because I could do something better. That's fine too. <laughs> Exactly. As long as get in the game, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just get in the game. Get in already. You got something to say? Go ahead. Like done Please. is better than perfect. Come on in. Done There's is better than perfect for everybody. Most definitely. When and where? That's right. I agree with that. I agree one hundred percent with that. And like the fact that the the voices that we hear the most are the people with power and money. Like it's time for the scales to be a little bit more balanced. It's time for the people who have been disempowered. It's time for their voices to be amplified and heard uh, more so because, you know, it's just time, like it's way overdue. So I agree with you. Like you may not be into what's happening, but maybe it'll inspire you to do your own thing. Exactly. You know, Octavia Butler said the first time she tried to write science fiction is because she saw, um, because she read a story or saw a movie and she was like, I could write better than that. And she was like 12 years old. <laughs> So, you know, it's like, that's the kind of thing that can definitely inspire someone. Yes, 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 yes. And I'm deeply inspired by like all of the people I see who are doing work, who are just like saying things that I feel like I hadn't thought about that that way. Or like, huh, you know. Um, oh, there's a question so, in the chat. Oh, is there? Mm -hmm. Sorry. What is oh, Michelle. it? Michelle Sturgis. Uh, she says, my cup is so filled with inspiration and affirmation. Thank you so much for the opportunity to listen and learn. And she says, I guess I do have a question. Any tips you have for acquiring support, funding fellowships and residencies? Sometimes I feel guilty when I have to do the double speak of saying what they want to hear so I can do what I need to do because Ooh. the real project isn't as sexy to the white gaze. Hi, Ooh. Michelle. <laughs> we could have did a whole talk on that, Michelle. That's a great that. question. Um, that's a great question. That is a great question. I think there's, it's interesting because Michelle, what you're speaking to, to me is like, that's kind of the crux of some of what we've been talking about. There have been projects where I applied for it and I spoke in plain, more or less plain language. I'm still articulate, but I didn't do the kind of code switch into kind of more formal academic language in terms of describing the project. I didn't get the funding. And then another year I do the, you know, pull out the cart, the horse, do the academic language and really kind of make it more decorative in a way, but like not more meaningful. And I got the funding. Um, and I was just telling Ola and Christina, I just got a rejection letter for a res residency today. So I feel like that is just the process that, you know, you can try to get them. I, what I'm trying to say is, I don't know if I have any advice for getting that funding <laughs> per se. But I will say that if it if at all times, the only thing I would say in terms of like, for me, advice would be to really remember your own value of what it is that you're trying to put into the world. Um, 
because in trying to get funding and trying to get fellowships and trying to get residencies, your work can be great. But like you are mentioning in your question, the gaze is, is just there. Um, and it is something that in terms of getting those kind of larger opportunities that one has to navigate. So it's like, if you just kind of always remember the value of what it is that you're doing, um, whether or not it gets the approval or the funding, or then I think that that's like a really solid place to operate from because it can be really discouraging sometimes when you're trying to get these things and like, um, you know, you get this feedback that's kind of like people don't understand it or they don't, they want it to be some other kind of way than it is, then you want to put it out into the world. That can be really discouraging, but I think in, in all of those kind of strivings to get those opportunities, just stay true to what you want to do in, in your voice. I think that's really, really important because the opportunities come and go. But if you stay true to like your, what you really want to say, that's that'll be a solid place to operate from. And eventually I think it will, from time to time at least, put you in contact with people who were waiting for that <laughs> and want to hear that, what you, exactly what you have to say. That's that's what I would say. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Christina. Thank you. I was just going to add real quick. I do think consistency is a big part of it too. Mm -hmm. Like, especially now that I'm older, I see now how like year over year, uh, you keep showing up in certain spaces, you keep participating, keep reaching out, um, kind of become more established in those spaces. But I know, I know it's frustrating for the young folk because they don't want to hear that. Um, but now that I'm older, I do see how how that works so I'm like yeah when you keep showing up to something year over year um eventually you do crack into it I guess is how I would say and I don't know how to expedite that um that we all I feel like everyone on this call has a reputation right and our reputation comes from years of practice not you know just a couple years dabbling here and there right um, so that's that's my advice like you just gotta stick with it regardless of if sometimes you are popular and sometimes you're not but this is your practice so you're just always going to be here doing this work um yeah 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 I definitely agree with consistency and I also 100% agree with the idea of like having your values in place as far as like what it is that you're, why it is you're doing this, doing this work and what it is you want to get out of it. Um, how are you, how is the work feeding you and who it is that you're interested in calling in and who it is that you want to mm -hmm. like have all these different ideas in mind and really focusing on like, just focusing on your craft and getting better and better at your craft all the time, like seizing opportunities to learn seizing opportunities to engage with other people who are doing similar things to what you're doing and like building community with them um, and applying for every single thing um, <laughs> that sounds like it might open you up to um, just sharpening, sharpening your practice, like applying for things. And if you don't get it, reaching out mm -hmm. to the folks and asking them, hey, is there something that my application was missing? Like, Sometimes they may not respond, but you know, you reach out to them, you put that energy out there. Right. Mm -hmm. And also, um, that double speak is not necessarily, um, damaging to your praxis. It's just like, as long as your praxis is always your praxis, if that makes sense. Sometimes yeah. you tell the people what they want to hear, um, <laughs> <laughs> To get to, to, get, the money to, to, get, to, to get to where you got to go, right? Period. You want to get, you want a residency at an art gallery and they're looking um, for you to do something about beauty. You can politicize that, you know, they want you to do, you got, you have a residency at a hospital and they need you to do something about mental health. You can work like, as long as you're working your specific praxis and like, she said, or they said, I'm so sorry, um, sticking to your values, then you're, I feel like you're, you're fine. And just like, don't give up on, don't give up on yourself. Right. I would say. Right. And it is, there is value 
as well to, I agree with what you're saying, to learning how to um, getting agile and describing your work to a variety of different stakeholders. There is a lot of value in that. So to me, even for in my practice, even when I apply for things and I don't get them, I still have that copy. I still had to like, oh, I'm applying for a sound design residency. Okay, well, I need to frame my stuff in that language. You know what I mean? Or I'm applying for a residency about like creative movement. It's like, okay, well then these are all opportunities for me to think about my work through that lens in my own particular way. And then if I don't get it, I still have the application materials <laughs> to kind of yeah. guide me. And, like it's always, good hold, always hold on to all your application materials, yeah. the artist statement, the essay, a essay answers, the references hold on to all that stuff i have all that stuff in my google drive in different period. folders period yeah hopefully that's helpful um and then thank you for noticing that question Ola. i definitely had looked but i didn't see anything yeah of course thank you michelle appreciate that appreciate that question well i know we're kind of wrapping up eBay we got like two. our ebay arts institute um what did you say? It's not a question, but oh, what is if that? this is what I think it is, I really love your your book, um, one one zero three three. That book is gorgeous, Crawley. Oh. I think that book is gorgeous. Oh, That's you've seen it? Yes. Um, I did a residency at Women's Studio Workshop, and they had it there on display. It's one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen. Wow. You really ate for that. You really ate. <laughs> it's, like hand, it's like handmade paper and it's shaped like a silhouette. It's just okay. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Okay. Right. Um well look, I know I do want to say just, you know, before we I don't know when the when the hammer is gonna drop with the time, but I did want to say once again, Christina. Ola, I appreciate both of you so much. There's a reason I asked you all to come be on this panel. Um, I appreciate your work in the world. Um, I appreciate being in community with you. I look forward to seeing you both in the third dimension at some point. And um, just thank you for being here to talk about these things. And thank you for sharing your experience and, and being willing to take part in this panel. I really appreciate y'all. just want to say that. Thank you, Golden mm -hmm. Light. Thank you. you are so brilliant, and I feel very affirmed and very like important that you asked me to do this. <laughs> I'm like, okay, they must think I'm smart or something. Um, I really appreciate it. I love your work, uh, and folks out there, please, if you're not on it, please check out Golden's work. It's just really funny. <laughs> Please check out Christina's work, Black Girls and Punk. I used to hey, it until you. my friend got her nose broken and then I never got in a pit again. <laughs> but I salute you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I salute you, child. Washing <laughs> <laughs> a somatic practice, baby. I'm, I'm on the outskirts it. of the pit. No longer. Because <laughs> seeing her wear that face mask, face brace for two weeks, I was like, nah, it's not worth it. I'm good. Yeah, yeah. I was actually, I was at a show the other night with some, a friend of mine, and she had been saying, like, I'm going to get in the pit tonight. And then the show hadn't been going for more than 30 minutes when someone fell, hit their head. They had to get a wheelchair, wheel them out to the uh, I'm too ambulance. Old. And yeah. she was like, I'm not getting in the pit tonight. Nope. No, I'm good. I'm good over yeah. here. Yeah. It ain't yeah. Real. I, you know, I miss the I miss that, you know, being punched around <laughs> and stuff, but yeah, I don't want any broken bones at this point. I'm a middle-aged black woman with no one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't play little games. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. All right, y'all. Yeah. Um, we went all the way to um, 30. Holly, thank you so me, much for Holly, sticking please around. Send me oh, an email. I would love to talk to you. Please send me an email, Crawley, at the free black <laughs> library at gmail.com. I'm a fan. <laughs> um you, golden christina and ola thank you so so much for going for the full 90 minutes it was amazing thank you i really appreciate it um everybody in the audience thank you um i'm gonna drop in the chat the the next and, and last session of the conference is 
um, on neurodivergent literacy. Um, I'm sending that in. Um, that's at three. So, you know, if you want to take a break and then log back on, uh, please do so. Um, otherwise, uh, Golden, Christina, Ola, thank you so, so much. Um, I feel like, I mean, I, I could ask questions for another hour and a half, but, um, but we're going to say goodbye for now. Um, and congratulations to you all on your amazing work. Uh, and thank you so much thank and have you. fun at the, at the Black Zine Fair. Everybody, everybody oh, in New York, yeah. go. Check it out. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.